No problem. Okay, I have Vanessa and I got Adrian. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I am Council Member Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today we are voting on 11 bills and one resolution that all aim to ensure that HRA clients are treated with respect and that HRA employees have the resources that they need to do their jobs effectively and efficiently. Most of us are familiar with the story of Jasmine Headley starting a December day attempting to reinstate her child care subsidy and ending the day with her child ripped from her arms and her placed in handcuffs. Regrettably, as Ms. Headley herself has said in news articles, unfortunate experiences at HRA centers are not unique to her case. The Urban Justice Center Safety Net Project published a report in February highlighting the challenges New Yorkers face while trying to obtain public assistance and SNAP benefits. Most of the HRA clients surveyed felt like they had been spoken to inappropriately, and many reported having their paperwork lost by HRA, and the large majority said that their calls were not answered. They also found average wait times of over three hours at job centers and two hours and 45 minutes at SNAP centers. The survey results showed clear improvements compared to a similar study conducted in 2014. In the five years of Commissioner Banks' leadership, HRA has undergone significant modernization and streamlining efforts by increasing self-service options, online applications and recertification, mobile document uploads and client-initiated scheduling for interviews on demand. We appreciate everything that has been done to make the system work better, but clearly more needs to be done. The abuse Jasmine Headley experienced was abhorrent. Jasmine should have never had her child taken from her. She should have never been sent to Rikers Island. In February, in response to what happened to Jasmine, this committee heard 13 pieces of legislation, uh, including intro 1359, a bill which I am sponsoring to require DSS to issue a public report on instances in which public assistance for a recipient was terminated and the recipient reapplied for such public assistance. Transparency is the key to identifying gaps and tracking progress at DSS. What occurred to Jasmine did not take place in a vacuum. The incident did, however, bring to light serious gaps in our city's social services system that we can change. This package of bills seeks to achieve full-scale improvement at HRA centers. I also want to thank uh, Jasmine herself for coming to testify at that hearing in February um, uh, we, we greatly appreciate uh, her taking the time and, um, and thoughtfulness to, to present to this committee. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. Uh, we're joined by Councilmember Barry Gredenchik of Queens, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso of Brooklyn and Queens, uh, Councilmember Richie Torres of the Bronx, Councilmember Brad Lander of Brooklyn. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank the staff of the General Welfare Committee, Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel, Krista Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, Julia Haramis, Finance Analyst, and Agatha Maravopoulos, Counsel, for their work on this package. I'd also like to thank my Chief of Staff, I'd also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and Legislative Director, Elizabeth Adams. Um, and I'd, I'd like to acknowledge all of the sponsors of legislation, um, uh, in, as part of this package, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel, Council Member Lori Cumbo, Council Member Vanessa Gibson, Council Member Donald Richards, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Public Advocate Jumani Williams, and Council Member Chaim Deutsch. And I, I do have statements from both Council Member Gibson and Council Member Adams um, that I will read into the record, but I'll first turn it over to my colleague, Council Member uh, Brad Lander. Do you have? Uh, a statement to make on on the legislation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just I really want to appreciate your your leadership. I mean, as you said, you know, the fact that, that Jasmine herself like found the courage and leadership to say we've got to make systemic change here um, after we all saw what happened there was very powerful. 
um, and I just I really appreciate that you um, have stuck with this. There's a lot to do here, and it would have been easy for this to be kind of a day of headlines, and then you know we've all pounded our chest, but we don't make real long-term change, and this is a really thoughtful package of legislation to try not only to respect and honor Jas Jasmine's experience, but just to use it to do better. I think a lot of times what happens with these bureaucratic systems is we just stop looking at them, and even if we could figure out new ways so that people wouldn't have to spend their time coming into appointments that they don't need, um, uh, we just stop paying attention. Um, and I really appreciate that you have stuck with this, and I'm honored to be part of today's package of legislation. So thank you. Councilmember Lander, do any of other my colleagues have anything they want to add to this? Okay. Um, I will read uh, the statements from Council Members Vanessa Gibson and Adrian Adams. Um, this is from Council Member Vanessa Gibson. Uh, Dear Chair Levin, I want to thank you and my fellow uh, General Welfare Committee members for your consideration of this important bill on today's voting agenda. Intro 1350A will require HRA to develop and implement a plan based on DSS HRA audit findings on job centers and SNAP centers. We have often heard of various complaints regarding HRA SNAP Center wait times, employee professionalism, and overall clientele satisfaction. Included in these stories are alarming instances of clients having to take days off of work just to rectify an issue at an HRA job center or merely obtain verification documents at SNAP centers. Intro 1350A will report on the current wait times at each job center, including how these wait times are calculated, changes implemented to improve efficiency at each site, changes implemented to improve staff to visitor ratios, changes to improve access to technology and better use of department's phone lines, and much more. Additionally, DSS HRA would be required to issue three subsequent progress reports over the next six years on such changes and their overall impact at job centers and SNAP centers. I thank you all for your attention and consideration of this bill. I thank you for your consideration once again and hope you will vote in the affirmative. Thank you, Vanessa Gibson, Council Member, 16th District, Bronx County, Deputy Leader, Chair of the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. And the, uh, the following statement is from Council Member Adrian Adams, 28th District, Queens, st statement on introduction 1333. Good afternoon. I'd like to start by thanking Chair Levin for his willingness to deliver these comments on Introduction 1333 on my behalf. As you know, over the past year, we have received many accounts of poor treatment of people visiting HRA centers in need of assistance. Many, us, many of us have seen the video of police officers yanking a one-year-old from his mother's grasp, mother's grasp in, Brooklyn, in a Brooklyn HRA center. It was during an arrest that was completely unnecessary. After the unfortunate escalation in the case of Jasmine Headley and so many others, we must take steps to ensure that this does not happen again. The daily protocol inside HRA offices is in desperate need of reform. Vulnerable New Yorkers that go to HRA offices for help should not have to second guess how they will be treated. I am proud to join my colleagues in a package of legislation to improve treatment of clients and quality of service at HRA centers. It is time that we address the flaws in our social services system. My bill, intro 1333, would require the Department of Social Services slash HRA, Human Resources Administration, to report on arrests, summonses, removals, escorts, and use of force incidents occurring in DSS, HRA job centers, and SNAP centers. I encourage my colleagues to support intro 1333 as it is a necessary step to improve accountability and transparency. We must ensure that this agency improves their policies and protocols to prevent future trauma from families in need. Um, and I, I, I just as the, uh, uh, the chair of this committee, I'd like to specifically acknowledge um, Council Member Adams, uh, Council Member and our Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, um, uh, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, um, Councilmember Inez Barron, um, for for speaking so um, so forcefully and um, and so compellingly on these matters uh, over the last several months. Um, uh, this was a very emotional um, um, issue for many of us, um, and. I think a lot of a lot of council members. Um, oh, and here is our majority leader right now. Um, 
felt that uh, a real responsibility uh, to do what we can on behalf of uh, clients of, of DSS and HRA. Um, Um, and, um, and I think that uh, this responsibility of this council um, to act, um, we are achieving in some small measure today. Um, there's still going to be more work that needs to be done, um, and we need to make sure that we are uh, valuing the contribution of all New Yorkers and uh, making sure that city agencies um, are treating uh, their clients, um, New Yorkers, um, with the dignity and respect uh, that they warrant and deserve. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, our majority leader, Lori Cumbo, uh, to deliver some remarks as well. I want to thank Chair Levin for your leadership and Speaker Corey Johnson for all that you have done to um, uplift this package of legislation that is so critical. Before I get started, I want to thank Jasmine Headley um, for her bravery and love for family and sharing your story um, with the world. Um, this has certainly been an eye-opening experience for what so many individuals, low-income individuals, individuals that have been economically marginalized, have to face day to day in the city of New York. It is a good day when we at the City Council can address long-standing institutional systematic challenges. We believe that all people seeking services should be entitled to professional, compassionate, and efficient care. No one ever should be treated in a matter that is verbally, physically abusive or cruel. We also believe that the municipal workforce in this city must be provided the same level of respect and must be paid for high quality professional development, training, and should receive appropriate salaries that match their experiences. Among all women in New York City, single mothers with children are the most economically insecure. Across the five boroughs, there are close to 300,000 households headed by women who are responsible for the care of more than one million children. Close to 40% of single mother-headed households are impoverished in the city, compared to just 13% of two-parent households with children. We are amazing, we are incredible, and we do have the magic. We are black women. We will not allow anyone to treat us less than. Navigating everyday life is hard enough, and as primary caregivers, it's even harder when the color of our skin can mean the difference between life and death. In the case of Jasmine Headley, officers violently ripped her 18-month-old son from her arms, and the world viewed the interaction, clear that the officer's behavior was unwarranted and downright wrong. It is essential that we stand together and firmly reject the criminalization of poverty. Annually, nearly three million New Yorkers rely on Human Resource Administration for economic support and social services through benefit programs. Both client and worker must have opportunities to re interact with an agency in a safe and positive manner. Several legislative reforms will be voted out of this committee today, and I'm proud to usher in Intro 1347, which is an innovative approach to provide clients an opportunity to alter appointments over the phone. Also, we will pass a resolution calling on the state legislature to provide a grace period before terminating public assistance or supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits due to a change in income and or employment. As a mother co-parenting and raising a son, and my son today just graduated to the big class, I can only imagine how traumatic it would be if I had to come to work today and found out that my benefits or the ability to send my child to school had been disrupted or interrupted as a result of some sort of clerical or administrative error. Our families cannot be torn apart. We cannot lose income. We cannot lose our jobs because we have to fight for issues around 
administrative or clerical upsets or mistakes that have been made. And I hope that my colleagues um, on the state and, and assembly levels will also recognize the power of this particular resolution and we will be able to pass it in Albany. I would like to thank our Committee on General Welfare, uh, Stephen Levin and all the council members and Laura Polpa and Jeff Baker that work together to address this unique um, situation that we hope will never happen in the city of New York anywhere in the world. This was a deplorable incident and was really has cast a dark shadow on the city of New York, but this package of legislation will begin to turn us in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo, and, and thank you for your uh, unwavering leadership over the last uh, seven months on this legislation. I also want to acknowledge um, uh, the chair of the Women's Issues Committee, Helen Rosenthal, and Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel uh, as well for their for their incredible leadership. Um, and um, just one last thing, uh, Councilmember Cumbo, you have a small child. I have small children. Councilmember Reynoso has, has a small child. Um, and the idea, as you said, that somebody can go to an HRA center for for reasons that were not her fault, or really should ought to have been her responsibility uh, to rectify, but had to take a day off of work. Um, the fact that she was potentially going to lose her child care because she was had found a job, um, uh, and then to have her, her child ripped out of her arms, I don't think that's something that any of us could even imagine. Um, and. Um, and if we try to imagine it, and I imagine that any of us uh, would uh, would do anything that in in our in our power to 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 hold on to our children. So, um, you know, we we need to keep uh, the human story and um, the human experience um, front and center as we move forward, uh, as we as we uh, run a city uh, that. Um, that ought to be more compassionate and ought to be more centered around uh, meeting people uh, where they are and, uh, and delivering the services in a compassionate way. So um, with that, um, I will uh, ask William Martin, uh, clerk of the committee, to call the roll. And thank you all very much. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote, committee on general welfare. All items are coupled. Chair Levin. Aye on all. Gordenchik. Aye. Lander. Aye, no. Reynoso. Permission to explain my vote. I just uh, want to say this could have just been a moment and could have passed with the leadership of many in the Women's Caucus and uh, Councilman Steve Levin and the work that you've done. Uh, we didn't let it be that, and we've come to closure and actually pushed um, meaningful legislation to change the experience of uh, the most vulnerable and neediest in our, in our city. So I want to thank you for that. And thank you to the Women's Caucus for uh, holding this as a priority um, and finally getting something done. So thank you, and uh, I, I would eye on all. Torres. By vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. All items have been adopted by the committee. Okay. Councilmember Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just I want to um, briefly draw the connection to the public charge issue, which is out there right now, which I think is important for us to see the connections here. Like so much of what we're doing, thanks to Jasmine, thanks to your leadership, thanks to the majority leaders, just recognizing the fundamental humanity of people who receive public assistance, who just like us want childcare for their kids and enough food to feed their families, and like part of what we're doing here is saying we're not going to accept some like line between people who receive public assistance and everybody else. Like, and obviously what the president is doing with the public charge rule is just trying to draw on the, some sense of stigma around public assistance to also demonize our immigrant families who are also, th you know, the hundreds of thousands in uh, New York City who want just the same things, um, you know, a safe place with their family um, that Jasmine couldn't find at that center. But boy, the idea that folks will have to choose between making themselves subject to deportation and detention and immigration enforcement and the child care that Jasmine was seeking or the food stamps or public benefits that make it possible to live in this city is, is galling. And it's the same spite and racism. And, and I just wanna, again, say thank you for the package, but also make sure we're connecting it to uh, to that atrocity that's taking place right at the same time as well. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Councilmember Lehner. Okay, um, so being that we are not expecting any other members, um, we will adjourn this committee here at 1.05.